I'm going to ask that we uh, go to the, the Lord's word in prayer. Amen. There's a word from the Lord coming out of the book of Colossians. We, uh, in doing our series, we did the book of Philippians, then we did the book of James, and now we are, are, are picking out some great verses out of the book of Colossians now. On last week, we preached from the subject, a pastor's prayer. Uh, this week, we want to look in chapter 2 and pick up at verse 6, and I think we'll go all the way down right around verse 14 or 15 or something like that. Let's read, let's stand for the reading of the Word of God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, the apostle says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive, through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the ele elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. May God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. I'll ask, amen. I think I... Amen. I asked the choir to sing earlier, and that was the song that they had prepared for this moment. That is all right. Let's go to the word of the Lord one more time. Coming out of second, excuse me, the book of Colossians chapter 2. I want you to read it. In verse 9, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Verse 10, And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by flesh, was put off. You were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised you from the dead. And once again, verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. I want to minister from the subject this morning. It's all in Christ. It's all in Christ. I need you to look at a couple of neighbors and tell them, neighbor, it's all in Christ. Amen. Wake them up if they look sleepy. Amen. It's all in Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, Lord. Uh, Lord, I just was a little bit thrown off this morning, so just help me, Lord, this morning getting myself together. Lord, just anoint me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Speak Holy Spirit, Lord. A lot has happened and transpired in this week and a lot of kind of stuff in our lives. My wife and our lives just kind of just kind of thrown up in the air, but Lord, we give you praise and we give you glory. And I thank you, Lord, that there is a word from the Lord. Lord. Speak Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. Speak to the people of God. Give them all that they stand in need of. Lord, we need a word from you today. Speak Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen. Amen. It's all in Christ. The church cannot forget that all that we need is found in Jesus. Uh, when you say something has 
everything in it, you're speaking of the idea that nothing else is required. You're speaking of the idea of completeness, not lacking anything. So when we say it's all in Christ, we're saying nothing is lacking in Jesus Christ. There's nothing needed to be added. Nothing could be taken away. It's all in there. Jesus is complete. It's all found in Christ. Our strength and all of our power, beloved, is found in Christ. Our hope and our confidence is all found in Christ. The, our provision, our protection is all found in Christ. Your healing is found in Christ. Your restoration is found in Christ. The peace we often forfeit because we don't go to the Lord in prayer is what? Found in Christ. The firm foundation that you need to be standing on is found in Christ. The rest that you need is found in Christ. It's all in Christ. The joy that you need, help me somebody, is found in Christ. The love and understanding we need is found in Christ. The woman at the well found the love that she had been searching for in Christ. Mary and Martha found out that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Uh, uh, the 5,000 hungry folk sitting on the hill found out that the bread of heaven is Christ. Matthew the tax collector found a new friend in Jesus. The man at the pool of Shalom found his best opportunity was in Christ. Blind Bartimaeus found his sight in Christ. Uh, the man that was dropped through the roof found his forgiveness in Christ. Um, I like how God put everything we need in Christ. You don't have to run over here, run over there. Everything you need is in Christ. You need power, it's in Christ. You need strength, it's in Christ. You need victory, it's in Christ. You need patience, it's in Christ. You need a new opportunity, it's in Christ. Everything you need is in Christ. All the law and the prophets is summed up in Christ. Uh, the sacrifices and the rituals are summed up in Christ. The priesthood and the temple are all found in Christ. That's why our worship has to be centered in Christ. The, the apostle already said in chapter 1, he said, the Son is the image of the invisible God. So when we look at Jesus, we see the Lord. The apostle continued in chapter 1 by saying that, for in him all things were created, the visible and the invisible. He's before all things, and in him all things are held together. He's holding all together. He's strengthening. Amen. He, he is everything. He's the beginning. He's the, he's the middle, and he's the end. He, he, he's everything. Apostle Paul said he's the, he's the head of the body of the church. Uh, he's a piece of supreme one over everything. For it was pleased to have him, the fullness, dwell in Christ. That's in chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. You see that. He says the fullness of Christ, the fullness of God, excuse me, is in Christ. Uh, so the church must remain focused on that. The church can't lose focus that all we do has to be centered in Christ. Uh, uh, we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ because Christ said in Matthew 28, 19, that we ought to go make disciples. We help the needy because Christ said we, what we've done unto the least of men, we've done unto Christ. We love one another because Christ says the greatest commandment is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Christ has to be in the center. What he wants and what we are supposed to do is because of what Christ said. Uh, we use our gifts and our talents because Christ taught the parable of the five talents that showed us that God has all given us something of value to offer and to be used for the building up of the kingdom of God. It's all in Christ. We serve one another because Jesus showed that we have to wash each other's feet. We are merciful because Jesus didn't condemn the woman caught in adultery. He just told her to go sin, a uh, sin no more. We, we get our hands dirty in ministry because Jesus said only the sick need a doctor. We do justice because Jesus showed us that when, the, that, that when people are taken advantage of, you ought to turn the tables over in the temple. Uh, uh, we, we have to center everything we do around Christ and the example that he showed us. Our focus can't be on our own agenda. Our focus can't be on the preacher. Our focus can't be trying to chase church trends and doing the latest church fad. We must be focused on being imitators of Christ, uh, making sure we understand all we need is in Christ is crucial for the church. 
For there is a temptation to focus on the wrong thing. There is a temptation to teach doctrine that focuses on the wrong issues. There is a temptation for false teachers to lead the church away from the understanding that everything is in Christ. This was a challenge that the early church leaders were facing in the early days of the church. And even today, there was a movement to get the believers in Christ to take their focus off Christ and and put their faith in things that aren't Christ-like. There are always someone trying to preach or teach that Christ wasn't enough. There was always someone trying to minimize the role of our Savior. There was always someone trying to say Jesus was less than. There's always someone trying to add something to the work of Christ. There's always someone trying to get church folks to put their trust in something or something extra uh, than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, If you want to be saved, you need Jesus and this other thing. If you want to be saved, you need Jesus and you need to be circumcised. That's what they would say. If you want to please God, you need Jesus and you got to worship on this particular day. If you want to please God, you have to have Jesus and follow this preacher or go to this church. Uh, Those were the arguments that they said. You you gotta you you gotta have some special knowledge. You gotta be able to talk to angels. You gotta be able to do this and this. These are all things they were saying. They were trying to add on to the work of Christ. They were trying to say you need Jesus and something. Jesus is not enough, so you need to add this to your Jesus uh, so that you'll be saved, so that you'll be right with God. And Paul wants to correct all of that. Paul wants to dispel all the myths uh, and help the church focus on the truth that everything they need is found in Christ. You don't need anything extra, just Jesus. In verse 6 of chapter 2, the apostle says to the church, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him and strengthened in your faith that you were taught. You see right here in the text. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces, which means just basic human arguments. Paul is letting the folks know that many will come uh, with some cool sounding arguments about the faith. But they should remember that those things didn't save them. Those things aren't the reason their lives were changed. Those things uh, that someone may be teaching aren't what made them brand new. So Paul lays out three crucial elements that the believers have in Christ that will help them fend off the false teachers that are trying to lure them away from the faith. The first thing that Paul needs to remind the church is that they have complete salvation found in Christ. This, oh, let me say it again. They have complete salvation found in Christ and found in Christ alone. Uh, let's look at verses 11 to the first part of verse 13. There were folks who were coming to the believers, teaching them that to have a covenant with God and to be part of God's people, they needed to be circumcised. That's a, a medical procedure that's done to males. Uh, they need the cutting of their flesh, flesh to be considered God's people. They were also saying that they needed a certain kind of baptism. Repeatedly, these false teachers were adding ritual on top of ritual and things that needed to be done in order for folk to, for, for folk, they said, for folk to be saved. Some of it was an attempt to have the Gentiles do some traditional Jewish rules, and some of it was to control the people by putting them under heavy burdens of of more rituals and more rules. And either way, it was minimizing the work of God through Christ and putting the role of your salvation on your works as opposed to the role of our salvation being based on the grace and mercy of God alone. It was dangerous uh, because it began to lead people to think their salvation Salvation is based on something we do as opposed to something we put our faith in. Yeah, that's, that's a big difference. Amen. It's a difference whether I got to do something as opposed to me just putting my faith in it. Amen. I didn't save myself. I put my faith in the fact that Christ saved me. Uh, I didn't deliver myself. I put my faith in the fact that God has all delivering power in his hand. I didn't take myself out of darkness and move myself into the light. God picked me up, turned Turn me around and place me on solid ground. I, I didn't do it. I, I was justified by faith. I've been redeemed by faith. I've been forgiven by faith. I'll be glorified by faith. I was sanctified by faith. It was faith in Christ, not my work. God didn't sanctify. I mean, I didn't sanctify myself. I didn't deliver myself. I didn't justify myself, and I won't glorify myself. All of that is done by Jesus Christ. Oh, they wanted to add something that Paul says in the first half of verse 13 is that God made you alive in Christ. 
You didn't need a physical circumcision of your covenant with God because God gave you a spiritual circumcision. And you were baptized in him through your faith uh, in the resurrection. Amen. You were saved when you gave God your life. He circumcised your heart. When you gave God your life, he baptized you into the spirit of God. That's why we teach that your baptism doesn't save you. It was your faith in the grace of God shown in Jesus Christ. Uh, we baptize you because you've already been baptized in the Spirit when you believe. How do I know that? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, you were placed in him when you believe. Not when you got baptized, not when you walked down the aisle, but you when you believe. You were placed in him. And then it goes on to say, Dick and Kevin, you were sealed with the Spirit of God. Uh, we got to teach it right. Amen. Uh, too many for churches and people that put extra stuff on the faith. Amen. Extra hoops you got to jump through. Extra rules you got to obey for you to be saved. But Paul wants to make it clear you were saved in him. And that's why we tell you can get saved anywhere because walking down the aisle isn't what saved you. Being in the church building isn't what saved you. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why John 14, 6 said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You don't come through Pastor Ha. You don't come through Deacon Kevin. You don't come through Trusty Mark Ali. You come through Jesus. Our complete salvation is found in Christ alone. That's why John 3 and 16 says, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him, period, now has the right to become, and that has eternal life. John 1, 12 says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I'm giving you a scripture here. You didn't get saved because you're tired. You didn't get saved because you went to a certain church. You didn't get saved because you spoke in tongues. You were saved when you put your faith in Christ. And beloved, that's the shout because I don't have to worry if I did this or that. All I need to know is that I put my faith in Christ, that I put my trust in Christ if so, then I, my salvation is complete. It's wrapped up and tied up in the Lord, and nobody can take it away. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fear. I don't have to doubt. I can have confidence that I'm saved. I have an eternal home. I'm a child of God. I've got a covenant with God. He won't break the covenant. He maintains the covenant. He won't forsake me. He won't leave me. He'll be with me in the good and the bad, in the ups and the downs. He'll provide for me. He'll bless me like a good father. He'll protect me like a good father. His plans for me is to prosper me and not to harm me. He's a good father. I'm here to let you know I've got everything in Christ. Your salvation is complete. Uh, it's in Christ. Amen. You got to put your faith in nothing else but Jesus. The complete salvation simply meant that those who put their faith in Christ are now God's people. They're not outside the covenant of God, but they're inside the covenant of God. They're protected for all eternity. They've been rescued and secure in Christ. They're, they're saved. They, they used to be on the outside, but now they're on the inside. Paul didn't want the church to miss that. Uh, he also didn't want them to be misled about the forgiveness of their sins. Paul not only wants them to know their salvation was complete in Christ, but he also wants them to know that they have complete forgiveness of their sins. In Christ. Let's read the text. In the last half of verse 13, it says, He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. indebtedness I can't barely say it. Which stood against us and condemned us. And it says, He has taken it away. Oh, y'all missed a shout. He forgave us all. All of our sins. All of them, the ones you did and the ones you're going to commit, uh, they, they've been paid for. The idea here is that we all stood condemned. We all had a sin debt that stood against our lives. We all failed to live up to the glory of God. We all have gone astray. But the good news is that in Christ, hallelujah, in Christ, let me say it again, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, every one of those sins has been paid for. This is the miracle of the universe. This is the miracle of all eternity that, the, uh, that, that one, sat, one person could die for the sins of the world and all of us go free. That is it. The debt has 
has been erased. God had the power to give you and I a pardon for the past, present, and future sin. How does he have the power when you study Romans chapter 8? Because he's the judge and he wrote the law. The judge and the person that wrote the law has the ability to give you a pardon. Y'all not hearing what I'm trying to say. Uh, when you get a pardon, guess what? It doesn't say you weren't guilty. It just says that the penalty for the crime won't be executed. Beloved, we were guilty as charged, but we are not innocent, but we've been given a pardon through Jesus Christ. Christ paid the price for us so that we might go free. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says "Look, that though your sins be red as scarlet, God said, I'm going to wash them white as snow. Isaiah 55 7 said, God said, I will pardon them abundantly. Uh, our sin debt has been paid in full. Uh, that's why Paul uses accounting terms to talk about the forgiveness of the Lord. He says the charge of your legal indebtedness has been taken away. The idea is that there was a record of your sin. And it showed up like a bill. But the bill had been stamped, paid in full. The charges were correct, Brother Green. It was an accurate accounting of your misdeeds and my misdeeds. But at the bottom of the paper, it was stamped, paid in full. Look, and you know what? You couldn't bring it up again. That's why Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore now there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Oh, look, you ought to shout right there. There's no shame. There's no guilt. There's no worry. There's no condemnation. You know what the false teachers would do? They would try to guilt the believer into doing some things. Uh, they were trying to use guilt and shame as a way to control folk and put heavy burns on them. And they wanted the folk to always feel guilty and ashamed. And folks still today use guilt and shame as a way to control people. People. But in Christ, we have complete forgiveness. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, we need to be thankful and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable every day for the fact that God forgave us for our sin. What do you mean, Pastor? If you want to look, look, being forgiven of your sins is not a license for you to keep on sinning. It is motivation for you to live right before the Lord. Amen. God has forgiven us. He's renewed us. He's blessed us, given us a second chance. What does that mean? That means now what I do is I offer myself daily as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable act of worship because you have complete forgiveness. Look, we have to show love to one another because we have complete forgiveness. We have to forgive one another because we have complete forgiveness. We've got to show mercy to one another because God showed us mercy and God showed us grace. So, so he says, I want, he said, he said, people are trying to trick you, but I want you to know you got complete salvation. People want to guilt you, but I want you to know you have complete forgiveness. Uh, and then, and also, not only do people want to trick you and let you think that you ain't got, you're not saved, and not only do folk want to kind of, you know, uh, uh, put a guilt on you and make you feel ashamed, but also folk want to uh, uh, make you steal your, steal your hope. So, so Paul says, now you have complete salvation in Christ. Hallelujah. See, if your salvation was in a person, you'd be in trouble. But you have salvation in Christ. You have complete forgiveness in Christ. And the good thing is because a whole lot of folk that love you won't forgive you. Yeah, let's be honest now. Some of y'all sitting around, some folk that won't forgive you. But in Christ, I got somebody that's going to forgive me. Love me in spite of me. Love me when I don't look good. Love me when I don't feel good. Love me when I don't act good. And still love me and say, come on, back to be my child. Look. But, but finally he says, but you also, this is a shout here, you have complete victory in Christ. Oh, let's, let's, what does the text say? Paul says, Christ won complete victory. It says, over powers and authorities. He meant Satan and all his demons. Paul says, I like this, he has disarmed them. 
You know what disarm means? It means you had power, but you ain't got it no more. Oh, my gosh. Look, look it, said, it said he made a public spectacle of them. It, it, at one point, they had power over death, hell, and the grave. But Paul said it's lost its sting. <laughs> oh, you know, Paul, when Paul said, he said death and the grave had lost its sting, what he said, it used to be they could hold you. But they can't even hold you no more. Jesus has freed us, amen, even from the bounds of death, hell, and the grave. And so he's freed you from that. Well, what's cocaine to hold you? What's heroin to hold you? What's your addiction to hold you? God can set you free. God can deliver you. Look, you can walk in complete victory. Satan does not have authority over you. Stop giving Satan power that he don't have over you. He's been disarmed, amen. Demons don't have authority over you. They've been disarmed. Your flesh doesn't have authority over you. You can walk in victory. You don't have to be bound. You don't have to be busted and disgusted. You don't have to be... Look, look, you are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. God has equipped you to battle, to face every battle that you're dealing with. He's giving you strength. He can give you strength for any challenge, power over any mountain. Look, you can walk in victory. That's why I'm here that what Paul was saying. Don't let nobody get you thinking that you don't have victory in Jesus Christ. Don't, get, don't let nobody steal your hope. Don't let nobody steal your joy. Don't let nobody steal your confidence. In Christ, you can be confident. In Christ, you can and walk with your head up high in Christ, you know you're forgiven, you're loved, you're accepted. And look, and He even wants even better for you than what you are right now. All right, all right. That's the sermon for today. Would you stand to your feet? It's all in Christ, it's all in Christ. You don't have victory because of Ralph Hodge, you got victory because of Jesus Christ. That's why I got to tell folks, stop putting all that, putting all that hope in preachers. They aren't the ones that saved you. Stop putting all that hope in churches. They aren't the ones that saved you. It's all in, in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's, and so for us as a church, we got to point to the Lord and direct everyone's attention to Jesus Christ. He's the only one that needs to be worshiped. The only one that needs to be adorned. The only one that needs to be exalted. He's our king. He's our Lord. He's our savior. Don't let anybody trick you. Don't let anybody guilt you. And don't let anybody steal your joy and your hope and your victory. You have victory. It's all in Christ. I'm here to let you know, God loves you so much. He won't even let your sin stop you from getting to the Lord. I'm a witness of that. I was sinking in sin. Far from a peaceful shore. And the Lord reached out and grabbed me. I wasn't even grabbing for him, Deacon. He grabbed me. The same God that led a sinner like me. Same God that gave me 10 chances, 15 chances, 1,000 chances. Is the same God that extends his hand to you right now. God wants you to know you can be saved today in just in a moment. All you got to do is ask Christ to come into your life, accept him, put your faith in Christ, and then begin to walk that journey of being a disciple. If you're here today and you've never made a decision for Christ, ministers, deacons, deacon assistants, let's assemble. If someone is coming today, if you're calling, if you're watching, you can call us right now, 804 232 5124. The ministers are going to the phones right now. But if you're in the building today and you don't know the Lord as your Savior, but you want to know him, it's real simple. You just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life and save my soul, and you'll be saved right then. Your next order of business is to get connected to a good church where we can help you grow in your faith. If you're ready to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, just come right now and say, yes, I'm ready to put my trust in Christ. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is already speaking to you to tell you to come. You're ready. Put your life in God's hands. Maybe you need a church home. Maybe you already know the Lord, but you don't, you're not connected. You need a church home. You can come now as well. Come on, choir, minister to us.
What a great hymn. Just as you are. God takes you just as you are. Is there one today? You know you need to make a decision. Come. To be your lamb of God, I come. I I'm going to ask you to be seated this moment. If you're coming for the right hand of fellowship today, we want to give you, prepare to give you the right hand of fellowship. We don't have anyone for today? All right. We don't have anyone for our right hand today. But remember, if you're one of our new members in the lab, Shelly, have you got your right hand yet? Okay. Oh, come on. We'll give you right hand of fellowship. Come on up, Sister Shelly. <laughs> Amen. Come right up here. Praise God. This is one of our new members, Minister Shelly Holt. Amen. All right. Come on, sister. Whisper your name to me real quick. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Second Baptist, this is Sister Shelley and Sister Sojourner. Let's give God some praise for them, some of our newest members. Amen. Now, we're not going to shake hands because <laughs> we're not going to do that. But in the scriptures, when there were new members in the body and they were ready to go out for ministry, they gave them the right hand of fellowship. It was a symbol of covenant, a symbol of partnership. And in that second Baptist, when we give you the right hand of fellowship, we're saying we're going to walk with you. We're going to support you, strengthen you, encourage you to grow in grace and to do, develop and, and use your gifts and talents for the Lord. And we're going to pray for you and support you in everything that God leads you to do. Is that all right? Amen. So on behalf of Second Baptist Church, I give you today the right hand of fellowship to our church. Church, let's give God some praise for now. Amen. And what we do, we ask, we get in the right hand, we want you to sit right here, so we're going to give you communion from right there. Is that okay? Amen. Second Baptist for Sister Shelley and Sister Sojourner. Give God some praise. Amen. God is blessing us. Amen. Now, we do want you to stand. We're going to do how we do our communion celebration is we read our church covenant, and then we serve the communion, and then we give the uh, benediction. So if you're ready to receive our communion and read our church covenant, I'll ask the media team, are we prepared to put it up on the screen? Let's read together. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter the covenant with one another, as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its worship, prosperity, and spirituality, to sustain its ordinances, disciplines, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger, to abstain from the illegal sale and excessive use of intoxicating drinks as a beverage, seek God's help in abstaining from all practices which bring unwarranted harm to the body or jeopardize our own or others' faith, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, 
and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. We moreover engage that we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. And now unto him who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, be power and glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'll ask now that our diaconate, deacons and deaconesses will come as we prepare for the, uh, oh, we're not serving our, <laughs> pastor forgot, we're, you already have, does everyone have the communion that one day? All right, if you don't, amen, keep your hands raised, we're going to bring it to you now, we've got a few, amen, let's make sure we take care of them right now, got a few of my far back, all in the back, on the far corners, ushers. Amen. If, if my ministers, if you have your communion, take your communion to any one of those folk in the back. All my ministers, take yours and make sure, take your communion to the folk in the back. Let's make sure we take them. And I got one of my sisters, a couple of my sister right over here and a brother over here. We're bringing up. Amen. Yeah. Okay. So while that's coming, Just for me, just, just for me, just for me. They pierced the wind Let's pray. Just for me. Come to you at this moment, Lord, as we come to your table, preparing to receive this juice and this bread, Lord, to remind us of what you did on the cross, how your body was broken and bruised and your built blood was spilled for our sins. But, Lord, we want to just take these common elements to remind us of your promise that you'll keep us and never forsake us, Lord. So, Lord, we take this bread and this juice, Lord, to remind us and to remember what you did and to remind us that you're coming back for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body. He also took the cup and poured it out and said, this is my blood. He said, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you remember my death. And he called us and reminded us we are to continue this celebration of communion, remembering his death, but also celebrating his resurrection until he returns. So brothers and sisters, let us eat and drink together. Let church say Amen. Let's go ahead and receive the benediction. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that it's all in Christ, that you made our salvation simple and easy. You didn't put it over there and over there. You put it all in Christ. All of our forgiveness and all of our victory is complete in Jesus. Lord, let's always continue to have Christ at the center of all that we do that we are mimic and model and imitate Christ in our behavior, in our words, and in our deeds. Bless us as we go from this place. Let no one trick us. Let no one shame us. And let no one steal our victory. For it's all in Christ. In Jesus' name. And all the people of God said amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.